Hey there, welcome. Um, this lesson today is not quite a teaching lesson. It is more so designed for you to take a measurement and tools of the chemist test, or you could use this video as a study guide. So what I will be doing is presenting a question giving you an opportunity to pause to answer that question, and then you can unpause the video and get the answer to that question. I'll walk you through it. Um, if you find that you have an issue with any of the topics, at the head of the video, at the top of the video, there's going to be the lesson code, and that will take you, um, you'll be able to figure out what video of mine to go back and watch to get some clarity on that particular topic. So uh, let's roll. First thing was experimental variables. So just to walk you through it, if you have issues with these questions, you should head back to the experimental videos, uh, experimental variables video to go check on that content. So right now, pause the video, answer these questions. All right, here's the answers. Um, the question was, what are the independent, dependent, and control variables? The speed of a toy car after being pushed depends on its mass. Independent variable there is mass. That is what we are testing. We will measure the dependent variable, the speed of these toy cars. And there's lots of controls. Two I have listed are the type of track that these cars are on, the applied force on the cars, um, plenty of other things. But that is two that I came up with. Okay, for the second one, the number of leaves on a pepper plant depends on the type of fertilizer used. The independent variable, what we are testing, is the type of fertilizer. The dependent variable is the number of leaves. You would count that. Counting is a measurement. And the some controls, the amount of water, the amount of light, the type of soil, growing season, plenty. Third up, if students eat eggs for breakfast, they will perform better on a spelling test. The independent variable is the breakfast that they're eating. We are testing eggs versus some other thing, perhaps cereal, Pop-Tarts. It doesn't say, but that's going to be somewhere in the experimental procedure. The dependent variable is going to be the score that the kids get on the spelling test and the control. Again, there's plenty. The kids should be eating the same amount of food. They should take the test at the same time of day. They should take the same spelling test. Um, lots of options there as well. Okay, second question is on graphing data. And for this, it says decide what type of graph would be used for each set of data, label the axes and data tables, label axes on data tables and graphs for each. I'm not giving you data to actually graph these, but um, you should be able to figure out how the data would be reported. And these are the same three experimental questions that we were just working with. Okay, for the toy car, your uh, data table would have its first column representing the mass of the cars. The second column would be the speed of those cars. And then on our dry mix graphs, speed goes on the Y axis and mass would go on the X axis. I gave it a title, speed of toy cars versus their mass. And here I would probably use a line graph. For the second experimental question, the number of leaves on a pepper plant, um, in the first column of a, the data table, we would put fertilizer, that is the independent variable, and then the number of leaves is what we're measuring. And it would translate here so that leaves, it would translate here so that leaves is on the Y axis and the type of fertilizer would go on the X axis. And I likely would use a bar graph to represent this data because I am assuming, yes, this is the type of fertilizer. So there would be brand A, brand B, maybe something homemade, and I would bar graph that. Final graph is the students eating eggs for breakfast and the spelling test. This one, I would do a double line graph. I would perhaps a triple line graph, depending on the other breakfasts that you were testing. Um, so we have the egg breakfast. We would take down the student maybe by name or with a score. Um, I would maybe do student one, two, three, four, five for egg breakfast and then 
whatever the other breakfast is, score goes on the y-axis, the student information would go on the x-axis, and then I would graph maybe the egg breakfast in yellow for the egg yolk, and then the other breakfast could go in green or blue, a different color, or you can also code it with your data points. You can do circles, squares, and triangles. Either way, I think a double line graph would be perfect for this data set. Okay, third question is some metric conversions. Make sure to pause to answer these. And your answers. 25 milliliters is equal to 0 0.025 liters. 0 0.04 kilometers is equal to 40 meters. No decimal because we want to keep the same number of significant figures. Uh, 75,680 joules is equivalent to 75.68 kilojoules. And 45 millimeters would be equal to 4.5 centimeters. Remember the thing to... With a decimal jumping, it's King Henry drinks unusually delicious chocolate milk. Okay, reading measurements. This one might be tough to read. You may want to grab a screenshot and zoom in to each of these graduated cylinders, but here they are for you. All right, my first graduated cylinder on the left is measuring at 7.60 milliliters. This means two digits behind the decimal because each of these lines represent two tenths. So our tool reads to the tenths place. We have to go one space beyond. So I got 7.60 milliliters. On the next two graduated cylinders, these are both reading in the ones place. So I have to estimate one digit beyond, giving me one number in the tenths place. For the second graduated cylinder, I got 67.0. And for the third, I got 145.8. And then the final graduated cylinder counts by tens. So this um, in the tens place, I know it's 444. Four, four. That was not on purpose. Um, the This four that I'm highlighting is the last known digit. So the final four in the ones place is the estimated digit. Something to note, you are reading from the bottom of the meniscus for each of these graduated cylinders. And if your measurements are off by a tiny bit, don't worry about it. Um, on these tests, oftentimes teachers will have a range of how far away your measurement can be from um, the picture. So for this one, the 45.8, I would allow my students um, probably 0.2 in each direction, perhaps 0.5 in each direction. It kind of depends, especially it depends on paper at how well it is printed. Um, you may have a teacher who asks you to um, go to the counter to read a real graduated cylinder on your test and A plus for that teacher. Uh, that's a way better way to do it. Uh, but most teachers do have a give or take on the answers. So the important thing to note here is that you're reporting the correct number of digits. So here on this first graduated cylinder, you absolutely should have the two digits because this is the way that this tool is reported. If you got 7.61 or 7.59, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, just make sure you're reporting the correct number of digits. That's within your control. Okay, accuracy and precision. The question says, a student determines the density of copper to be 9.02 grams per cubic centimeter when the accepted value is 8.96 grams per cubic centimeter. What is the percent error of this student's calculations? We would plug that into the percent error equation and we would do 9.02. 0 0.02, the measured value, minus the accepted value, 8.96. Divide the whole thing by the accepted value and multiply it by 100 to get it into a percent. And this student is very accurate because they are um, underneath that 5%. Remember, 5% is how we determine whether our experimental results are valid or not. This kid got really good data because they're less than 1% off, which is fantastic. Counting significant figures. Remember to use the Pacific and Atlantic rule for this one. 
All right, 2.000 has four significant figures. All of those trailing zeros count because there's a decimal. In 0 0.320, we have three sig figs. The leading zero does not count, but the trailing zero does. In 900 without a decimal, the decimal is absent, so you'd come in from the Atlantic side and skip those two zeros, only leaving you with the nine. 150 with a decimal, all three of them count because the decimal is present. You would start counting at the one, count the five, and the zero. 808 has a sandwiched zero, and sandwich zeros always count, so that has three significant figures. And finally, you have a combination of all four of your significant figure rules. Your decimal is present. You would come in from the left, skip those first two zeros, hit the 98040. That gives you five significant figures. Number seven is math with significant figures. You are going to calculate each of these and then round your final answer to have the correct number of significant figures. The first one is three plus two, uh, which we know is five, but the question is how many zeros do you put behind the five? Um, this three has three numbers behind the decimal. The two only has one number behind the decimal. We need to match our answer to the question, the number in the question that has the lowest amount of precision. In that case, we are, um, because we're multiplying, I'm sorry, because we're adding, that is going to be focused on the decimal places. So 2.0 has one number behind the decimal. So our answer should have one number behind the decimal, leaving us with 5.0. 5.3 times 2.8 is multiplication, and in multiplication, we are still going to match our answer to the question, the number in the question that has the least precision, but we're going to focus on the number of significant figures. Both of these numbers have two significant figures, so our answer should have two significant figures. The calculator gave us 14.84. To round that to have two significant figures, we'd round it up to 15. 8.750 minus 2.4, the calculator is going to give us 6.35, but we need our final answer to have one number behind the decimal because we're subtracting, and that is going to take our 6.35 and round it to 6.4. 94.5 divided by 32.80 gives us a very long number. I even chopped it off here, um, and this is where significant figures is actually important. Where do you round this crazy number? Um, we are going to match the lowest precision because we are dividing. We're focused on the number of significant digits, which here in 94.5 would be three sig figs. So our final answer should also have three sig figs. That is going to leave us with 2.88. Finally, we have 6.00 times 2.5. That is comes out to 15. You plug it in the calculator, you're just going to get 15. Um, we need our final answer to have two significant figures because this is multiplying. We're focused on the sig figs, um, and that is going to give us the final answer of 15. Whether you write a decimal or not, it doesn't matter because the one and the five are always significant, but there is nothing behind that decimal. Next up, you should convert the standard notation into scientific and the scientific into standard notation. 32,000 would be 3.2 times 10 to the fourth. 0. 0.00058 would be 5.8 times 10 to the negative fourth. Again, the negative exponent does not indicate you're working with a negative number. It indicates that you're working with a number smaller than one, but greater than zero. Um, so that's the negative exponent. 1.8 times 10 to the eighth means that you move your decimal eight times in whatever direction is going to give you the bigger number, which in this case is to the right. So when we do that, we would jump behind the eight, and then seven more jumps would give us seven zeros behind that one and eight, giving us 180 million. And finally, 3.7 times 10 to the negative fifth means we're working with a very small number. So we're going to move the decimal to the left to make that number small. We would have 0 0.000037. So that was four leading zeros and then 37. 
Last on the list is volume and density. You have two questions here. A graduated cylinder's reading is 65.2 milliliters and rises to 83.7 upon the addition of a stone. What is the volume of that stone? And secondly, it says the density of ethanol is 0.789 grams per milliliter. What is the mass of 14 milliliters of ethanol? We are going to take the beef for volume and subtract it from the after. So after minus before or final minus initial. And that is going to leave us with 18.5 grams per cubic centimeter on that weird shaped stone. And then for the density calculation here, we have the density and we have the volume. So we would plug in those numbers and solve for the mass. You cross multiply. Uh, you put the density over 1 and then cross multiply. So you would have 0.789 times 14 is equal to the mass times 1. And that leaves us with 11.046 grams. And based on the rules of significant figures here, we have two sig figs in the 14. Our final answer should have two significant figures, leaving us with 11 grams. Now, I hope you did well. I suggest that you use this as a study guide, of course. Determine which of these questions were really easy and move on. Determine which ones were difficult and revisit that information so that you feel super confident going into whatever assessment your teacher is going to give you. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Subscribe so you don't miss the next unit. We're moving into atomic theory. I can't wait to see you there. Bye.